Hello everybody, uh, my name is Paul Shattuck. I'm the parent of a man aged 44 with a severe form of autism. Uh, I, I'm here today, I can, could not come to Cartoon, I'm afraid it was impossible, so I've had to make two videos of the presentations that I would have made. So the first presentation is about services for people with autism. I'm also uh, the past, immediate past president of the World Autism Organisation, so parents from all over the world are sending you their greetings. And this is where we are today. I start off by showing you this picture. I'm a parent of a young man with autism, and that's what I looked like in 1975 when my son was diagnosed. And now you see me in front of you, bald, fat and toothless. I know what it's like to be a parent with autism. We parents have things in common which we share. We are a band of brothers and sisters. Uh, I have more in common with the parents in Khartoum than I do with the people who live next door to me. And we have to fight and work together to get things as they should be. Now, autism was first described not by Americans, not by Germans, but by a Russian lady, Professor Sukareva, who wrote about it in 1926. The others probably heard about her work and extended it further, but autism has been known for a very long time. How many people with autism are there? It's very difficult to be certain about this because many of the studies are not well conducted. I tend to use this study from the United States, which came up uh, with a figure of 17.4 in 10,000. In other words, 174 in 10,000 people have an autism spectrum disorder, uh, which means one child in every 58 is diagnosed with autism, and one boy, given there are more boys than girls, one boy in 35 in the United States has, has an autism spectrum condition. And if we intervene early, we can make big changes to the way things would have been. How much does this cost? Well, for the people with autism themselves, it's devastating. Uh, they can't understand the world, they're frightened, and they're anxious, fearful, and often in pain as well. For the families, it makes life very difficult. There is work has to go by the board, and life effects on lifestyle can be devastating. For the community, the state as a whole, it is very expensive to support people with these serious conditions. We really must do something about it. And the people with autism themselves, politicians, professionals and parents have a duty to minimise these problems by working together and finding solutions. And that's what I want to talk about, some of these solutions and how we can work together. There's a big political dimension to this. To reach 10,000 people in New Jersey, 174 have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosed. Uh, that means that each of them has two parents, each of them probably has a sibling, a brother or a sister who would be affected. Each of the parents have two parents, grandparents of children with autism. Each of them will have, each parent will have a brother or a sister, so that's the uncles and aunts of people with autism. And each of them, each of these parents will marry and have two children, that's another group of people affected. When you add this together, it comes to 27.84% of the population has a close relative with an autism spectrum disorders. You can win general elections in most countries in the world with a size as big as that, with a vote as big as that. We've got to work together to produce the solutions to this very serious problem. It's not going to go away. Ignoring it is not an option. It cannot be resolved without massive intervention. This picture is not very clear but the problem is getting parents and professionals and people with autism to work together. Getting people to agree on everything is like herding cats, which is what this is supposed to represent. People won't work together, they all have their own agendas, want to do it their way, people are selling you things commercially, and we, but we do need to speak together with one voice singing from the same song sheet. The type of service which is developed the, depend where you live uh, and the same way as a crop depends on where you're living. The, the climate in Khartoum is very different from what it is in Sunderland in the north of England so crops will not grow in the same way, you can't do it. It depends on the culture, the community and the finance available. 
uh, for what we do when we develop services. You cannot pick up a service from the United States or from England and put it down in the middle of Sudan and expect it to work. It cannot do so. We've got to find Sudanese solutions to these Sudanese problems. I want to stress to you, first of all, the role that parents have had ever since the beginning. When my son was diagnosed, it was believed that the parents were to blame. It was because we didn't give them the love and affection and cuddling that they needed. But it was parents who thought this was the orthodox view of the medical establishment, and all the books said this. It was not until parents such as Lorna Wing in England, Bernard Rimland and others in the United States, James Gill in Denmark, got there and said, no, this is rubbish. There is something clinically wrong with our children. And it was parents who fought against the medical establishment. They were wrong uh, at this point. It was parents who set up the first schools. It was not the state being kind to our children. Parents did it themselves. And there were lessons for all of us in the way this developed. You may be interested to know that the first school in the world was actually in Denmark back in 1926. Uh, and this school is celebrating its 90th birthday this year. We're having a special conference for it. It was not Americans or English, it was Danes who set up the first school, and it's still going now well. As I say, a conference is going there. There's also parents who set up the first adult services. It was not the state, it wasn't the hospital board, it was parents who did it, bought the buildings and did it themselves, and it's still a huge role for parents to take the initiative in what's going on. That was the first adult services in the world at Somerset Court in England, which was owned by parents. They bought it, converted it, and operated and run it. And this culture still exists in our part of the world. There is a peculiarity about the United Kingdom and about Ireland, which is different, which makes things easier for us. There is a culture of pioneering spirit in parents, in doing things themselves. If something is wrong, we have to take responsibility and do it ourselves. So most of the services are owned and operated by parents, but the state pays the fees for the children and adults in them. That doesn't pertain in most of the world. We have to find different solutions, but that's the way it is here. There have been no meaningful developments in services or in research that have not originated with parents, full stop. Parents are involved in all of these activities but we need the support and guidance of professionals to keep us on track here. And gradually there's been an evolution of responsibility passing more to people with autism now themselves. 